Manitoba, land of large lakes and rolling rivers. Bordered by Ontario to the east and Saskatchewan to the west, the territory of Nunavut to the north, and the U.S. states of North Dakota and Minnesota to the south, Manitoba is a province of Canada at the longitudinal center of the country. The principal meridian of the Dominion Land Survey was established at 97 degrees west longitude, which passes just west of Winnipeg. The location of the first meridian was chosen because it marked the western limit of settlement. Covering 650,000 square kilometers, Manitoba has widely varied landscape with Arctic tundra and the Hudson Bay coastline in the north and dense boreal forest, large freshwater lakes and prairie grassland in the central and southern regions. Manitoba is Canada's fifth most populous province with a population of 1.3 million as of 2021. As Manitoba's capital and largest city, Winnipeg is the seat of the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba, the Provincial Court, as well as the Provincial Government. Known as the Gateway to the West, Winnipeg is a transportation hub. It is centrally located on the main lines of both Canadian National Railway and Canadian Pacific Railway. From a Trans Canada transportation perspective, apart from being a crucial node of the Trans-Canada Highway, Winnipeg is the starting point of Highway 16 or Yellowhead Highway, which is dubbed the Resource Highway of Western Canada. Indigenous peoples have inhabited what is now Manitoba for thousands of years. The name Manitoba originated in the languages of the indigenous peoples, including the Cree and Assiniboine First Nations, who lived on the prairies and traveled the waters of Lake Manitoba. Legend has it that at the Lake Manitoba Narrows, as strong winds sent high waves crashing the rocks of river banks, the sound from the waves is said to be the Manito, or Great Spirit. Another suggestion was that it came from the Assiniboine Minitoba, meaning Lake of the Prairie. In the early 17th century, British and French explorers began arriving in the area and engaged in fur trading with local indigenous peoples. Great Britain secured control of the region and created a territory known as Rupert's Land in 1670, named after Prince Rupert, who was involved in the early stages of the Hudson's Bay Company in the late 17th century. Rupert's land was placed under the administration of the Hudson's Bay Company. Fur trading forts were established by the Hudson's Bay Company and the Montreal-based Northwest Company. The two companies merged in 1821. Rupert's Land was ceded to Canada by the Hudson's Bay Company in 1869 and incorporated into the Northwest Territories. Louis Riel, a founder of the province of Manitoba and a political leader of the Métis people, played a central role in Manitoba's joining the Canadian Confederation. In 1869, Negotiations commenced between Métis Council and the Government of Canada for the creation of the province of Manitoba. Louis Riel preferred the name Manitoba over the proposed alternative of Assiniboia. During the negotiations, several factors led to an armed uprising of the Métis people against the Government of Canada, a conflict known as the Red River Rebellion. The resolution of the conflict and further negotiations led to Manitoba becoming the fifth province to join Canadian Confederation. When Parliament passed the Manitoba Act on July 15, 1870, 
seeking to defend Métis rights and identity, Louis Riel led the resistance movement against the Government of Canada. After a polarizing trial in 1885, Riel was hanged in Regina for his role in the Red River Rebellion. As the saying goes, given enough time, justice will prevail. On November 16, 2020, the 135th anniversary of Louis Riel execution, a huge ceremony took place to commemorate the legacy of Louis Riel and his profound sacrifice and enduring influence. Senior federal government officials paid respect to remember Louis Riel as a great Métis leader and advocate for the protection of the rights and culture of the Métis nation. Today, Louis Riel is celebrated as a hero, particularly as the father of Manitoba, and he is remembered for his championship for equal rights and social justice, his defense of Métis and Francophone rights, and his dream of Métis taking their rightful place within Canada. The Government of Canada has acknowledged that, because of Louis Riel, the Métis will never again be ignored or forgotten. Furthermore, the federal government is committed to working together in partnership with the Métis Nation in building a renewed relationship, a relationship based on affirmation of rights, respect, cooperation and collaboration. When the Canadian Pacific Railway made its way to Winnipeg in 1881, an extended period of growth and prosperity followed, around the start of the 20th century. As Winnipeg became a central hub in North America, a growing number of immigrants from Europe settled in the city and other parts of the province. By 1911, Winnipeg had become the third largest city in Canada and remained so until overtaken by Vancouver in the 1920s. Manitoba has been at the forefront in terms of leading the trends of societal change. For instance, Nenny McClung, author, politician and social activist, started a campaign for women's votes. Thanks to her efforts, in 1916, Manitoba became the first province to allow women to vote in provincial elections. This was two years before Canada as a country granted women the right to vote. Dramatic social change as a result of the First World War and its aftermath paved the way for the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919 lasting six weeks from May 15 to June 25th, with over 30,000 workers going on strike, it was the biggest strike in Canadian history. The strike ended tragically, resulting in injuries of dozens of protesters and two deaths. Today, the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike is remembered as an important historical event where workers demanded collective bargaining rights and living wages. It's worth mentioning that both English and French are official languages of the legislature and courts of Manitoba. According to Section 23 of the 1870 Manitoba Act. However, the Manitoba Act does not require French to be an official language for the purpose of the executive branch, except when performing legislative or judicial functions. The Manitoba French Language Services Policy of 1999 is intended to provide a comparable level of provincial government services in both official languages. Also in 2010, the provincial government of Manitoba passed the Aboriginal Languages Recognition Act, 
which gives official recognition to seven indigenous languages, notably Cree, Dakota, Dene, Inuktitut, Michif, Ojibwe, and Oji Cree. Manitoba is at the center of the Hudson Bay drainage basin, with a high volume of waters draining into Lake Winnipeg and then north down the Nelson River into Hudson Bay. The Hudson Bay Basin's rivers reach far and wide, west to the mountains, south into the United States, and east into Ontario. Known as the province of 10,000 lakes, as a matter of fact, Manitoba has more than 110,000 lakes, and these water bodies cover more than 101,000 square kilometers, or nearly 16% of Manitoba's surface area. Manitoba's major water courses include the Red, Assiniboine, Nelson, Hayes, White Shell, and Churchill Rivers. Among these, the flat and fertile Red River Valley is world famous. The Red River is a river in the north central United States and central Canada, originating at the confluence of the Bois de Sioux and Otter Tail rivers between the U.S. states of Minnesota and North Dakota. It flows northward through the Red River Valley, forming most of the border of Minnesota and North Dakota. The river crosses the U.S. Canada border just before reaching the town of Emerson, Manitoba. Winnipeg is at the Red River's confluence with the Assiniboine River at a point called the Forks. Then, the Red River flows further north before draining into Lake Winnipeg, which then drains through the Nelson River, eventually into Hudson Bay. The Red River is about 900 kilometers long, of which over two-thirds are in the States, and the rest in Canada. The river falls 70 meters on its journey to Lake Winnipeg. Several urban centers have developed on both sides of the river, including the city of Winnipeg in Canada, as well as Fargo and Grand Forks in the U.S. In the United States, the Red River is sometimes called the Red River of the North to distinguish it from the Red River of the South, a tributary of the Atchafalaya River that forms part of the border between Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. The Red River was long used by fur traders. It was the primary means of transportation between Lake Winnipeg and the Mississippi River system. French explorer Pierre Cotier de Varennes arrived in the Red River Valley area in 1732. He called the river Rivière Rouge because of the reddish-brown silt. The Métis people established a community in this area sometime before the British defeated France in the Seven Years' War. The Red River was a key trade route for the Hudson's Bay Company and contributed to the settlement of British North America. As an important highway for trade, the Red River has been designated a Canadian Heritage River. The popularity of the Red River was greatly boosted by Red River Valley, a folk song of uncertain origin. There is anecdotal evidence that the song was known in at least five Canadian provinces in the 19th century. With some variations, the lyrics express the sorrow of a local woman as her lover had to depart. From this valley, they say, you are going. We will miss your bright eyes and sweet smile. For they say you are taking the sunshine that has brightened our pathway a while. Come and sit by my side if you love me. 
Do not hasten to bid me adieu, but remember the Red River Valley and the girl that has loved you so true. The Red River Valley song has been rated one of the top 100 Western songs of all time, or even considered among the top 10. Uh, geologically speaking, the Red River is rather young. The word valley is a misnomer. While the Red River drains a large area, the valley it has created is remarkably flat. The river, slow and small in most seasons, does not have the energy to cut a gorge. Instead, it meanders across the silty bottomlands in its trip north. As a result, high water has nowhere to go except to spread across the old lake bed in overland flooding. Heavy snow or rain, especially on saturated or frozen soil, have caused a number of catastrophic floods, which often are made worse by the fact that snowmelt starts in the warmer south and waters flowing northward are often dammed or slowed by ice. <clears throat> Winnipeg was inundated during the 1950 Red F River flood and had to be partially evacuated. In that year, the Red River reached its highest level since 1861 and flooded most of the Red River Valley. The damage caused by the flood led then Premier Duff Roblin to advocate for the construction of the Red River Floodway. After six years of excavation, the River Floodway was completed in 1968. Permanent dikes were erected in a number of towns and south of Winnipeg. In 1997, the flood of the century caused over 400 million Canadian dollars in damages in Manitoba, but the floodway played a key role in preventing Winnipeg from flooding. The Assiniboine is a 1,000 kilometer river that runs through the prairies of Western Canada in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. It is a tributary of the Red River and is a typical meandering river with a single main channel embanked within a flat, shallow valley in some places. Flowing through urban centers including Brandon and Portage La Prairie, the Sinniboine River winds its way east, eventually joining the Red River at the Forks in Winnipeg. For thousands of years, people came to meet at the Forks. Food, fur trade, and settlement have drawn people to this vital river junction. Manitoba's major lakes are Lake Winnipeg, Lake Winnipegosis, and Lake Manitoba. Lake Winnipeg is Manitoba's largest lake and the 10th largest lake in the world by surface area. Lake Winnipeg covers 24,000 square kilometers and represents 3.7% of Manitoba's surface area. About 436 kilometers in length and 111 kilometers across at its widest point, Lake Winnipeg has two distinct basins, the North Basin and the South Basin, separated by the Narrows, which is a 2.5 kilometer wide channel. As a matter of fact, Lake Winnipeg is even larger than Lake Ontario. Lake Winnipeg's drainage basin is 953,000 square kilometers in area, and the shoreline of the lake is 1,000 750 kilometers long. Although Lake Winnipeg is a relatively shallow lake with a mean depth of 12 meters, it provides drinking water, supports wetlands, and a variety of plants and wildlife. There are many native fish species, for example, lake whitefish, walleye, yellow perch, which play an important part of the lake's food chain and ecosystem. Lake Winnipeg 
is a major source of subsistence fishing for families living in fisheries-based communities and plays a central role in preserving the traditional lifestyle of the indigenous peoples. Within the Lake Winnipeg Basin, there are 55 million hectares of farmland in the three prairie provinces. More than 10,000 cottages are located around the south basin of Lake Winnipeg. Gimli, on the west side of Lake Winnipeg, is the largest Icelandic community outside of Iceland. It offers some of the best ice fishing opportunities in winter. Manitoba provides fabulous opportunities for outdoor activities and exploration of nature. While Bodhi Mountain is the province's highest point at 832 meters above sea level, the 756 meter Riding Mountain is a year-round hotspot. The forested parkland stands in sharp contrast to the surrounding prairie farmland. It was designated a national park because it protects three different ecosystems that converge in the area, namely grasslands, upland boreal, and eastern deciduous forests. Well known for all sorts of outdoor opportunities, Riding Mountain National Park has some of the best Manitoba hiking trails. Keep your eyes peeled for wildlife while hiking. There's a good chance you can see moose, black bear, eagles, owls, as well as deer. Riding Mountain is easily accessible by car from two municipalities. Dolphin lies 13 kilometers to the north, and Brandon is 95 kilometers to the south, connected by Manitoba Highway 10. Manitobans are nature lovers. After Victoria Day in late May, residents of Brandon start their daily hikes on riverbank trails again, while many Winnipeggers flock to their cottages in Gimli on weekends. Provincial parks such as Spruce Woods and Spirit Sands are popular destinations. Among other things, I love Winnipeg's well-maintained urban forests, particularly the beautiful linden trees whose leaves are heart-shaped. Historians believe that the first farming in Manitoba was along the Red River, where corn and other crops were planted before the arrival of Europeans. In spite of Manitoba's continental climate and cold winter, according to Environment Canada, the province ranked first for clearest skies year-round and ranked second for clearest skies in the summer. As summers are generally warm to hot with low to moderate humidity, southwestern Manitoba is favorable for farming, and that's why Brandon, the wheat city of Canada, hosts an agriculture research and development center, which was established by the federal government back in 1886. As one of the original five agricultural stations, the Brandon Center is now one of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's network of 20 research and development centers, with a research focus on developing new and improved varieties of wheat, oats, and barley, and soil and nutrient management. Apart from the Brandon Center, another agriculture research center is located at Morden, which is further south. Established in 1915, the Morden Research and Development Center focuses on cereal and oil seeds crop pathology, genomics, and sustainable and profitable crop production systems. In 2021, there were 4.6 million hectares of cropland in Manitoba, accounting for 12% of Canada's cropland area. The 2021 Census of Agriculture counted 14,543 farms in Manitoba, with an average size of 
470 hectares per farm. The number of farm operators in the province were 19,465 people in 2021. Grain and oil seed farms are the largest sectors in Manitoba. Manitoba's top crops are canola, spring wheat, alfalfa, soya beans, and so on. Livestock remain prominent on Manitoba's landscape, including cattle, hogs, sheep, and horses. Farmers talk about the three A's, namely April for seeding, August for harvest, and America for the major market of their farm produce. Churchill is a town situated on the southwest shore of the Hudson Bay, at the mouth of the Churchill River. With a population of less than 5,000, Churchill is best known as the polar bear capital of the world, attracting a large number of visitors in the fall. Also, many tourists come in the summer to watch beluga whales in the Churchill River. Without road connections, Churchill is accessible by air and rail, either a two and a half hour flight or a two day train ride from Winnipeg. The port of Churchill is the only Arctic deep water port in Canada. Manitobans love sports. While weather is a frequent topic, by far the most popular topics are the Winnipeg Jets and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. During National Hockey League season, Jets fans converge at downtown Winnipeg and spend the night at one of the mini bars. When Blue Bombers play host in a football game, residents within three kilometer radius of University of Manitoba campus are either glued to their TV screens or anxiously waiting for the thunderous crowd noise each time their home team scores a touchdown. Serious fans follow the Blue Bombers team when they play on the road. There are other popular sports as well, and curling is certainly one of them. As a major multicultural city, Winnipeg hosts numerous annual festivals, including the Festival du Voyageur, the Winnipeg Folk Festival, and the Jazz Winnipeg Festival. In particular, Folklorama is a multicultural festival that runs for two weeks each August in Winnipeg. Visitors have the opportunity to celebrate the cultural and ethnic heritage of residents from dozens of cultures who have made Winnipeg their home. Located in downtown Winnipeg, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is a national museum, the first Canadian national museum located outside the national capital region. On April 20, 2007, Prime Minister Stephen Harper announced the Government of Canada's intention to support the CMHR project. On March 13, 2008, Parliament passed legislation to create the Canadian Museum for Human Rights as a national museum. After five years of construction, the CMHR held its opening ceremonies on September 19, 2014. Beginning with the Great Hall at the base, visitors make their way up to the Asper Tower of Hope, a 100-meter glass spire where visitors have a panoramic view of downtown Winnipeg. The purpose of the museum is to explore the subject of human rights, enhance the public's understanding of human rights, and promote respect for others, and to encourage reflection and dialogue. The museum has become an important place where citizens from across Canada learn about human rights. Indigenous perspectives regarding land are highlighted in the displays of the museum. Think about the following passages. 
the indigenous philosophies are premised on the belief that the human relationship to the earth is primarily one of partnership. I believe that the most important thing for us as Michif people is land. If we have land, then we have a place to nurture our future generations. One of the best summary of Canadian values is the famous 1960 quote by John Diefenbaker, the 13th Prime Minister of Canada. I am a Canadian, a free Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to worship God in my own way, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I believe wrong, free to choose those who shall govern my country. Every visitor to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is bound to walk away with a deep impression of these important numbers about Canada. One country, ten provinces, three territories, many languages. Notwithstanding the fascination of Winnipeg, Brandon, Portage La Prairie, and other major urban centers, Manitoba has numerous charming towns and communities. Explore Souris, which is known as Gem on the Prairie, by walking over the locally famous Swinging Bridge and appreciate the pride of the residents of this historic village when it won the title of National Winner of Communities in Bloom in 2005. Go to one of many Métis celebrations in the summer to listen to the touching stories. Visit Wawanisa Village to see the headquarters of a major insurance company operating across Western Canada. Stop at Boulder, home of Tom Johnson, eight-time Stanley Cup champion and 1970 National Hockey League Hall of Fame inductee. Go to the historic Manitou and you will understand why it is more than a small town. The well-kept village museum at Somerset offers a wonderful opportunity to travel back in time. Stop by Nipawa, a town that claims to be the land of plenty. On your way to Gimli, remember to take a picture of the huge statue of Peter's Field, home of the Mallard Duck. Landar is a community with pride, so is Ericsdale. The stone statue of Stonewall is true to the name of the town. Canada Day celebrations at Winkler are as exciting as in any other towns and villages in Manitoba. Don't leave Winnipeg without paying a visit to the Assiniboine Park to learn about Winnie the Pooh story. Winnie was the name given to a female black bear that lived at London Zoo from 1915 until her death in 1934. As a popular children's book published by Alan Alexander Milne in 1926, the story began in the northern town of White River, Ontario when a black bear cub was adopted by Harry Coburn before embarking on his overseas duty in England. The bear cub was very popular on the war front and eventually sent to the zoo in London, England. The little bear brought much joy to zoo visitors. Manitoba, Canada's central province, is full of natural beauty. It is a land of lakes, rivers, bison, and above all, great people. No wonder the cowboy in the legendary Red River Valley song was reluctant to bid adieu to the sunshine and to the loved ones at home.
Thank you for watching and listening. Please subscribe to this channel, Words of Woods.